affects per their internal systems uh, because poverty affects their ability to eat or eat well. So I think it affects them, you know, in terms of how they're able to, to function throughout the day just as a biological person. Kids who don't have money always feel like they're left out. Um, it makes it hard, hard on them to get along with some of the kids because they're always in a begging mood or a wanting mood. I also think that it affects them emotionally and socially. I think it affects uh, people's connections that they have in life. I think it affects their, um, not just their self-esteem, but just the way that they're able to handle themselves in the world because of the resources that they have in their life and the experiences that they have. Somebody with money is going to have a lot more access to opportunity and experiences than somebody without. So I think it affects kids in, in so many different ways. Poverty strikes at their self-worth. I mean, there's some kids you know have to wear the same clothes every day. Um, you know, they just don't feel good about themselves. Uh, we try to help them out like I told you before, with giving them, giving them clothes when we can and, and food to help them. So you try to build up their self-esteem, their self-worth. I think um, the way that I've seen it the most is that uh, a kid who's dealing with poverty in their life is going to have a tough time being prepared for school. It's harder for them to be able to sit in a classroom and be able to say, okay, I'm ready to learn and, you know, give me whatever you got because I'm ready to take it. I mean, they haven't had breakfast in the morning maybe. They haven't, they're malnourished in some way because they're not getting the food that they need. That's affecting their ability to think, do those things. I also think that families in poverty are dealing with um, more stressors in life. You know, for instance, folks who are in poverty normally are working multiple jobs. I mean, I would say there are more people working multiple jobs than not at this point in poverty. So you actually have an issue where people don't have the time to be able to spend with their kids to be able to read to them and do those other things. And there's a chance too, because of the cycle of poverty, that there's somebody that is um, is there that might be trying to do something for their kids or might you know be trying to read to them, but they themselves haven't had a very strong education or a very strong educational background, so they don't have the resources to be able to share that with their kids. The root issues have to do with several different systems. Their ability to have resources when they're growing up, so the family system itself, like what their family can provide for them. The education system is a huge piece of the puzzle. The way we fund education in the United States makes it so it's unequal based on where you live. So if you live in a really poor area, you are not going to have the same resources in terms of public school as somebody who lives in a really rich area. So that makes it kind of continues that cycle of poverty again, but more on a larger systemic level. So I think the root causes have to do with all the, the ways that we we structure the system that is built around everybody. It's the way we structure our economy, it's the way we structure our education system, it's the way we structure the way people get food. I mean, it, I think it, it goes all the way, looking at all those different things, you have to be able to affect all of those if you really wanna deal with poverty in some way. What I don't think it is, is the approach that we're currently taking. I don't think that we can fix poverty by throwing money at it after somebody's already poor. Um, you know, and giving them just lots of benefits and those types of things. I think those things are necessary because of the system that we have, but it's not a way to fix poverty necessarily. Um, I also think that the, the ways that, that don't work are things like, you know, other, other programs that are trying to just put a band-aid on it versus really trying to fix it. I don't want to, um, I definitely don't want to overshadow or, or look past, I should say, the the ability to be able to go downtown and help somebody, you know, at like a, a soup kitchen or something like that. You know, I mean, to be able to serve food to people who are in need right now, to be able to provide goods to them in some way. So that might be, you know, like clothing and material goods and that kind of stuff or some sort of assistance that people need. That is absolutely necessary. And it's a perfect way to volunteer time to be able to do that stuff. It's very necessary based on the system we have. So we started a meal program probably about seven years ago that's really expanded. Uh, in the summer we actually feed them two meals, so that takes care of part of the problem. Uh, we also give them a place to go 
um, a lot of the kids that are in poverty that have a, a one person or both parents working need a place to go because they can't go home after school or during the day so they can also come here. We do uh, a Christmas giveaway um, the last couple years we've been able to get up to 60 kids but our membership's over 300 so we're not touching all the lives we're touching quite a few uh, we also get donations of hats and gloves and coats that we try to distribute to the kids during the winter time but again I would say we're probably maybe at a 70 or 80 percent ratio with uh, kids that need those type of uh, uh, goods and services, but we don't have uh, the resources to go out and get more. Well, donations is always a key factor. I mean, the more money that we get in, um, we get donations for membership. We really don't get a lot of donations for anything else except at Christmas time. Uh, we've had people in the past donate dinners. We pick out some families, but there's all kinds of different things they could do with uh, clothing, um, even if it's used clothing. Um, it cheers up every kid to get a Christmas gift. Um, just different things like that. Money's always the, the easiest factor. Um, I used to do speeches for the United Way at different businesses and what I would tell them is you don't have the time to come here. If you give me money, uh, I can apply it towards the kids and then that will that will basically take the place of you being here. All that said, those things are still just gonna be a band-aid in the end. So it's something that's helping people momentarily, but it's not fixing the problem. I think if people really wanted to fix the problem, I think they could. I think we have to talk about it the right way though. I think we all have to recognize that we don't actually know what we think we know and then go out and try to learn what's really causing poverty in somebody's life and in a lot of lives. I mean, when you have 20 to 25 percent of the kids in the United States in poverty and they qualify under our really low absolute measure for poverty, there's, it, it's hard to believe that we're not trying to deal with that. But we really aren't. You know, we really aren't doing anything to try and help that. So I think if if people really thought about that more, I think it would change the conversation. I think if people tried to learn why poverty really happened, I really think it would change the conversation that we have personally and change the conversation that we have politically to be able to really make some good changes. The cycle of poverty is basically just that if there's one generation that's poor, there's a good chance that the next generation is going to be poor. And then that cycle continues on. So it goes from one generation to the next. And it's hard for those folks in that next generation to pull themselves up and jump out of poverty in some way. So it really is this kind of never-ending cycle, or it can be never-ending.